Hello, I think we're live. It's uh, really nice to see you all again. And uh, today it's a great, great pleasure uh, to have with us uh, Natalie Morris Sharma, uh, who's a longtime friend, both of uh, Nilofer and I. She's from Singapore, and I can say she, for sure she's one of the rising stars in international law in Singapore. So it's really uh, with great pleasure that on behalf of uh, Nilofer and myself and of the E Academy, we'll welcome you, Natalie, finally, finally, as a guest speaker of the CIL E Academy. Um, Natalie is um, going to be talking to you um, in this module on international organizations, on the role of international organizations in forming state behavior. Um, and she has extensive experience in this area since she's a government legal counsel with the Singapore's Attorney General's Chamber. And she advises uh, the state of Singapore in a different range of matters in public international law. Um, and uh, she has also been director of the International Legal Division in the Singapore Ministry of Law and legal advisor to the Singapore's uh, permanent mission uh, in New York, where we met uh, on several occasions and where um, you're still doing, and you just said you were going to do it soon again next week um, in New York, uh, the negotiation of the Ocean's Omnibus Resolution, uh, which really shows, us, shows also the different uh, breadth of your experience. You've participated, Natalie, in, uh, um, in, uh, in several bilateral and multilateral negotiations, including tra trade and uh, investment agreement in negotiations. And probably one of the things that I wanted to highlight, because I'm sure you're going to be talking about it, is your uh, role um, as a chairperson of the working group that developed the Singapore Convention on Mediation and vice chairperson of the 50th Central Commission session, where it share the discussions that led uh, to the adoption of the NC trial mandates for investor state dispute uh, settlement reform. And you're currently rapporteur of the NC trial group um, on the investor state uh, dispute settlement um, uh, reform. So um, you have certainly um, uh, extensive experience um, in how international organizations work um, and how they help or um, uh, um, uh, lead um, also states uh, in uh, shaping uh, their behavior. And we're looking forward uh, to listening uh, from you. And uh, um, I acknowledge at least he was here just uh, before that Professor Reinisch is also uh, with us, at least for the beginning of the lecture. And I'm sure that you'll see that uh, uh, this uh, week's sessions um, are extremely complimentary. So, Natalie, a great, great welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have you in the Academy, um, and we are really looking forward to hear from you. And after that, we'll have a QA and a open to the participants. The floor is yours, Natalie. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you to Nurufa as well, uh, friends and, and really in many ways mentors uh, to me over the years. Um, and I'm for count, uh, really, um, it's a bit of privilege of mine to have had the opportunity uh, of sharing my thoughts and, and various experiences along the way um, with you uh, as friends. And um, thank you for having me for the CILE Academy today. I'm really excited to be engaging with all of you. It's, uh, I've been, I'm told that you are a fantastic bunch of people. I only wish that this was in person, but uh, we're now so used to working electronically and this is a, this is a wonderful way to ensure that the CIL e Academy's reach is as broad as it can possibly be. Um, so a, a warm welcome to all of you, um, even though I'm only joining you for an hour today. Um, I will be speaking in my personal capacity. Um, I've also been engaging with Professor Reinisch uh, in the run-up to our time with you this week. 
and I know that he's prepared an extensive and detailed set of lectures on the topic. Um, and what I wanted to do in the hour that I have with you today is to focus uh, on the relevance and role of the of international organizations, uh, as Patricia said, in informing state behavior. So um, as government legal counsel, this is an aspect of uh, IO work that, or the, an angle of IO work that uh, I see a lot more um, uh, come at the issues a lot more from the angle of, and I wanted to kind of uh, draw on that uh, in our time together today. I have a set of slides which I will flash uh, shortly, but maybe before I do that, while I have this face time, some preliminary remarks to set the context. Um, I think we can all uh, appreciate that IOs have become uh, increasingly relevant in the international arena and we can attribute amongst them two re main reasons for this. First, the increasing number of issues that transcend national borders and second, the need for developing and promoting common standards uh, and common solutions rather at the international level. International organizations are relevant because they provide an opportunity for cooperation on a larger scale, offering platforms and processes for continuous dialogue and engagement, including the development of international legal instruments and mechanisms for the resolution of disputes, amongst others. And international organizations are also units of public power and authority. They generate instruments that are addressed to state behavior as well as the conduct of other stakeholders. And these can include legally binding and or voluntary elements, normative or guidance elements, policy or technical standards. And I was reading uh, in my preparation for today some surveys that have been conducted by the OECD. And there was one in 2015 that highlighted that international organizations, at least those that participate in the survey, produced a total of around 70,000 legal and policy instruments. So we're really talking about a very rich area of practice um, that uh, kind of feeds into interstate behavior. The instruments that um, IOs generate really, uh, I therefore find very, very interesting, but at the same time, the mandates and the powers of international organizations are diverse, and that makes generalizations very difficult. So in the course of today's lecture, I will be focusing very specifically on three uh, I would, I'm, I'm about to say international organizations, but a couple of them are, are bodies more than organizations, subsets of the UN. Um, so I'll, I'll be speaking about the UN Security Council, specifically its sanctions resolutions, UNSA trial, the UN Commission on International Trade Law, its conventions, model laws, legislative guides and model rules, and the World Health Organization, specifically its regulations and recommendations. And I selected the World Health Organization because of our very recent experience in the pandemic context. So with that in mind, let me um, share my slides with you. Here we go. Um, and, and as part of my concluding remarks, I also want to spend some time talking about uh, the relationships of international organizations with each other. So IO to IO and also IOs with other IOs that are uh, the governmental or international governmental organizations with non-governmental organizations and other types of IOs, which I think was covered in the typology that was outlined by Professor Reinisch. Uh, so first up, the UN Security Council and its sanctions resolution resolutions. The UNSC, uh, as you might already know, is one of the principal organs of the United Nations, established under Chapter 5 of the UN Charter, comprising 15 member states, 5 permanent members, 10 non-permanent members. The 10 members are elected on a two-year term basis. The Security Council's primary responsibility is the maintenance of international peace and security. And in order to do so, the Council, Security Council can make a range of measures, which can include the imposing of sanctions, the use of uh, armed force, authorizing the use of armed force. Security Council resolutions are the principal form uh, by which the UN Security Council acts, and not all resolutions are binding or have binding legal effect on member states. Many can be, for instance, internal to the UN legal order, make a recommendation on the appointment of a security 
Secretary General, they have no binding legal effect on member states. Now, for our current purposes, what I'm concerned with today, or what I'd like to focus on today is a narrower ambit of Security Council resolutions. Um, and these are those which contain a binding decision to impose a sanction or on a designated state. Such decisions affect states as under the UN Charter, all members of the UN are under a legal obligation to accept and carry out the decisions of the UNSC under Chapter 7. And the Charter makes it clear that if there's a, com a conflict between an obligation which a member state has under an international agreement and one imposed by a decision of the Security Council, the latter shall prevail. Um, what are sanctions? broadly a co coercive tool that are employed to apply pressure on a target state, an organization, or an individual to change their behavior. The legal um, definition of sanctions under the UN Charter is fairly wide, referring to measures not requiring the use of armed force. And these can range from comprehensive economic and trade sanctions to targeted measures. Um, including arms embargoes, travel bans, financial commodity restrictions, and so on. And um, there are 14 ongoing sanctions regimes, which focus on supporting political settlement of conflicts, nuclear non-proliferation, counterterrorism. Under the Security Council sanctions regime targeting the Demetic, De Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK, for instance, all member states of the UN are required to prevent the sale of arms, nuclear ballistic, nuclear ballistic missiles, and other weapons of mass destruction to the DPRK. And this is to prevent the DPRK from conducting nuclear tests or launches in breach of customary international law. At the level of state conduct, it bears highlighting that there are circumstances when it may not be so clear cut whether a particular clause results in binding obligations on a member state. Um, and so a lot of the time when we in government uh, are examining the text of Security Council resolutions to see what our obligations are they're, they're under, um, there, there sometimes can be an extensive exercise into interpreting into in interpreting the text. And the question of determining whether a particular provision in a Security Council resolution is binding on a member state um, has actually been the subject of much scholarly literature as well. And one factor is the, the, is the express words where the Security Council decides or deciding that something should, should be done. Um, but no, these no, words totally. are not often used. Um, so, uh, this was the outline that I was talking through earlier, and then I'm just on my first slide here. So yes. caught me just in time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so where so we were talking about how you need to determine from the text um, if a certain clause uh, is results in legally binding obligations on a member state, and this can be an issue of interpretation. Um, we can look at the express words that might say uh, where the Security Council decides or deciding, but these, but that magic word may not always be employed. And so we need to look at other factors in the resolution, such as the object and purpose of uh, the uh, Security Council resolution and other words, um, express words in the provision, the addressee of the resolution and so on. The, the language, why is the language not clear, even though um, we're talking about uh, resolutions that may be adopted under Chapter 7? The, actually, Sir Michael Wood has written a lot, a lot on this topic, um, criticizing Security Council resolutions as not being clear, simple, concise, or unambiguous, which are the qualities that you would expect of, of good uh, legal drafting. But that really is because the drafting of these resolutions is very much part of a politicized process or a political process. Um, and the desire for consensus can creep in uh, to or uh, uh, counterbalance the desire for legal precision. And sometimes it, it's, a, it's a case of striking a balance between those two sets of interests. Um, the settled language in a Security Council resolution, as with many multilateral instruments and negotiated instruments, um, are often the result of negotiated outcomes, uh, which sometimes leads to language that may not be as precise from certain perspectives, but precise in other ways. Um, nevertheless, even though an obligation may not clearly create legally binding obligations, um, there, there are states such as Singapore that adopt a cooperative and facilitative approach where possible to assist in sanctions implementation um, and in order 
to ensure that there are no sanctions violations. And this is underscored by the UN Charter that requires that member states shall join in affording mutual assistance in carrying out measures decided upon by the Security Council. The, the next element uh, is on monitoring on compliance of these um, Security Council resolutions, which I think is also a very interesting part of the practice and also um, an informing factor of state conduct. Um, there are, after a sanction is imposed, the Security Council regularly creates other subsidiary bodies to support or monitor the implementation of the sanctions. And one of these is a sanctions committee. Um, the, the mandate of such a committee will vary based on the resolution that establishes it. Some matters which a sanctions committee would look into uh, would include seeking information from member states with a view to monitoring the effectiveness of the domestic measures imposed by that member state and taking action uh, on any information reported to them regarding violations of sanctions measures. And a committee may also decide whether in a specific case, an exemption to a sanctions measure is justified. So for instance, in the case of the DPRK sanctions regime again, uh, while there are wide sweeping bans on the import of certain goods into the DPRK, the resolutions provide for humanitarian exemptions for the import of such goods where it facilitates the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And whether such requests are granted are then determined on a case by case basis by the sanctions committee, the 1718 committee in this case, um, as they oversee the sanctions measures by the Security Council on the DPRK. If comprehensive sanctions have been imposed on a regime, again, as in case in the case of the DPRK, for example, then a sanctions committee may also be further assisted by a panel of experts. So we have sanctions committee on one side, panel of experts on the other. And unlike the sanctions committee, which comprises government officials of member states, panel of ex panels of experts are independent experts. Um, they really are the arms and legs of the sanctions committee and their work includes gathering and analyzing information from states regarding the implementation of sanctions measures, as well as incidents of non-compliance. And it is not uncommon for a panel of experts to, for, for example, send letters to member states seeking more information on alleged, alleged violations of sanctions, which could then be um, duly compiled in a report of the panel, which would then be submitted to the sanctions committee. In addition to the monitoring of sanctions compliance, the views of sanctions committees and panels of experts may lend guidance to the interpretation and implementation of Security Council resolutions by member states, even though such documents um, that are generated are not authoritative in, in I guess, in the usual ways. Um, examples include implementation assistance notes, fact sheets on measures imposed by the relevant resolutions, um, also formal reports by the panels of experts. Uh, this, these, these are actually very useful tools and insights into um, the implementation of the Security Council sanctions regimes because Security Council deliberations, as you know, are secret and there are no public available, publicly available negotiation documents, or travel repertoire, um, which might be useful to shed light on the intent and surrounding context of particular provisions in the resolution. And so these um, views or reports or um, interpretative documents that are issued by a sanctions committee or panel of experts would help to fill that gap to a certain extent. These monitoring mechanisms of um, Security Council resolutions, I would say, are generally effective. The reports published by the panel of experts or any failure to give effect to UN Security Council resolutions have the potential to affect a state's international standing. Um, and in fact, uh, Singapore has regularly weighed these kinds of considerations in our decision making and, and even publicly, it's been articulated in our domestic courts. We've had cases um, where uh, the UN Security Council sanctions regimes uh, have been the subject of a case of criminal cases before our domestic courts. And our prosecution have relied on um, impact statements from our foreign affairs ministries that often highlight 
factors such as harm that can accrue to Singapore's reputation and international standing uh, in the event of sanctions violations by a, an accused person. So this is an this is an instance of how ostensibly soft uh, outcomes um, of a monitoring regime does have a very material impact uh, on state conduct. In fact, Singapore also regularly submits implementation reports to the Security Council to demonstrate how we've complied with decisions of the Security Council and um, our experience uh, in the context of the entire universe of Security Council sanctions regimes is not unique. Uh, I think would would I could probably say that we would be quite representative um, of other states who similarly take their international ob legal obligations seriously. So with that, that's the first category um, of, uh, the, of this uh, theme of relevance and role of IOs and impact on state conduct that I wanted to draw out, focusing on a very traditionally recognized um, area of international law and binding international legal obligations. The second and third buckets um, that I have selected for today cover slightly different areas. Um, the next uh, organization uh, or body of work that I wanted to highlight today is that of UNCTRAL, the United, Commission, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, and they have a variety, the, the UNCTRAL issues or generates um, work products that are of different natures um, and they influence state conduct in quite a different way, but it is is merited, I think, by the area of expertise and work in which UNCTRAL operates. So UNCTRAL is a subsidiary body of the General Assembly created in 1966. It was established by um, the General Assembly to further the progressive harmonization and unification of the law of international trade. Um, what does harmonization mean? What does unification mean? According to the UNCTRAL Secretariat, harmonization may be conceptually thought of as the process through which domestic laws may be modified to enhance predictability in cross-border commercial transactions. And unification may be seen as the adoption by states of common legal standards governing particular aspects of international uh, transactions. So a model legislative uh, guide, a model law or a legislative guide would be examples of harmonization, while a convention or would be an example of unification, according to the ancestral secretariat's dichotomy and understanding. Instead of being focused on trade policy, public law aspects governed by institutions such as the World Trade Organization, UNCTRAL focuses on private international law. So this would be the law applicable to private parties in international transactions. And the idea here is that diversity of legal rules and procedures in areas such as contracts, jurisdiction, um, these act as hindrances uh, or, the, or such diversity acts as a hindrance to deeper economic integration across states. And it is the same driving force um, that led to the creation of UNCTRAL that was behind the formation of bodies such as the HCCH, the Hague Conference on Private International Law, and the and UNIDWA, the International Institute for the Unification of private law. But what's very interesting um, is that UNCTRAL's creation in 1966 was also against the backdrop of the, po the post-World War II um, global system when we had newly independent states that were beginning to engage more pre proactively in the multilateral system, bringing focus on issues such as aid and investment from developed states, also criticisms of the international economic order of the time. Um, so what uh, the, the, his, the historical um, historical narratives and the historical reports uh, have conveyed and, and have reported is that uh, the United States and its allies wishing to engage more deeply in these discussions um, because also of uh, the Cold War era where they were fighting for influence amongst different states. Um, whilst they wanted to engage more deeply, they also desired alternative uh, institutional arenas that were less politicized, less confrontational than, for example, UNCTAD at the time, um, the UN, UN Commission, I think, on Trade and Development, uh, so that they could continue to advance a more market-oriented agenda. And so through the negotiations on the diplomatic conf 
conference on the New York Convention on Arbitral Awards that was in 1958. Um, they, and the initial and very quick success of the New York Convention, the US and its allies started to explore creating another institutional space for harmonization uh, of, of the law of international trade within the UN system. And so that's what led in a bit of a roundabout way uh, to UNCTRAL being established in 1966. And in fact, UNCTRAL adopting the New York Convention, although it was something that was developed before that time, to within the body of UNCTRAL's work. Anyway, so that's the historical view, um, but for our current purposes, we also need to look forward. Uh, Anson Charles' work is conducted at two levels. First is an annual plenary or commission session that sets broad policy directions. And the second um, is a, a bunch of intergovernmental working groups that are assigned a specific area of work. There are currently six working groups tackling issues such as insolvency, electronic commerce, dispute settlement and investor state dispute settlement reform. And I was previously involved in dispute, this dispute settlement working group, and I'm now involved in the investor state dispute settlement reform group. And talking about the constitution of these working groups, I think would be, uh, and in fact, comparing them to each other could be the subject of another uh, block of time with you. But for current purposes, I think what would be important for us to appreciate is that UNCTRAL members are a subset of the UN membership uh, there are 70 elected members of UNCTRAL. These are elected from UN member states, but they draw from different geographic regions. Uh, originally, actually, UNCTRAL had 29 states, and then it became 36, 60, and very recently, um, sometime this year, I believe, or last year, we increased it to 70. Uh, the intention is for the, these members to be representative of different legal traditions and levels of economic development. And so the General Assembly elects members for terms of six years um, and every three years, they, they kind of refresh half of the group. United Nations member states that are not members of UNCTRAL, however, as well as international and regional organizations, whether intergovernmental or non-governmental, um, they are invited to attend UNCTRAL annual sessions, the commission sessions, as well as the working group sessions as observers. And that's quite an interesting model um, of engagement of non-members of UNCTRAL and non-state representatives uh, within the UN system. Uh, but it's been very effective in ensuring the representation of diverse interests in UNCTRAL. And I will touch a little bit on this when we get to my concluding remarks. Um, in the context of what it means for UNCTRAL's work, while decisions are taken by member states, the views of non-member states and observer organizations are taken into account when um, member states determine or the chairperson of the negotiation determines the positions on issues that the room um, has, is taking. And the long-standing practice is to reach decisions by consensus. So you would declare a consensus taking into account all the views that are heard um, by member states, but also the views of non-member states and observer organizations. And it's very much an inclusive, or it's it's meant to be anyway, ideally, a very inclusive, and it is more often than not, uh, a very inclusive negotiation process. And that's why the texts are widely accepted as offering solutions that are appropriate for different legal traditions, also countries at different stages of economic development. Now, UNCTRAL um, articulates its legal norms through um, a variety of forms, which can be legislative and non-legislative in nature. And their work products include conventions, model laws, legislative guides, and model rules. Conventions are adopted by the commission and then put out for ratification by states. Um, and as you would know, by, by treaty law, you sign, you approve a convention, you commit to the obligations that are articulated within that convention. Uh, typically in an ancestral convention, uh, you would have to conform to a common international approach. Examples are the Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, CISG, and the Sing more recently, the Singapore Convention on Mediation. It was opened for signature in Singapore 7th of August, 2019 and entered into force September, 2020. Um, and for instance, the Singapore Convention on Mediation, it offers a common framework for um, the, the enforcement of mediated international settlement agreements. And uh, it, that's been said to be, have been a barrier for the take up of mediation. So with this convention, the idea is that that obstacle at least has been removed, uh, encouraging 
the, that demand for mediation to be fully pursued. Model laws are models that states can adopt to or, or use to reform specific elements of law within their jurisdiction. And these are generated um, usually as a reflection of consensus on key principles or structures that should govern an area of commercial law. Um, they are flexible in that they are models, so they're issued as, as statements as well as, as statements as it were, as to what a law could look like, uh, but states can either adopt or adapt model laws to their needs. So we have the model law on international commercial arbitration, with the model law on international commercial mediation, and these are to varying ex extents uh, incorporated and used as a, a base for various um, jurisdictions to develop their own domestic laws. Legislative guides are intended to aid states in development and uh, reform of particular areas of law as well. And these are usually uh, targeted or addressed to the interpretation of a model law. So we have the 2004 Legislative Guide on Insolvency Law um, that offers certain interpretations on the model law on insolvency provides guidelines to legislative bodies um, and uh, usually it provides certain legislative suggestions within the guide as well, guide on an enactment contain, containing things like policy options um, and it's really it's quite a soft um, compared to everything else that I've talked about it's one of the softer work products of Ancestral uh, but um, can also be quite effective um, because of its, its soft nature in the event of certain maybe levels of resistance that you might find within certain jurisdictions, uh, they might be more amenable to a legislative guide than to, than to for instance, saying that they would be adopting a, or adapting from a model law. Over time, what has been interesting, um, at least in, in my time being involved in Answer Trial's work, I saw the shift um, starting in 2010, uh, or rather, I, I think I was in the middle of that shift in 2010 to focus on the development of model laws and legislative guides, and then a shift back now uh, to also develop conventions once again. And that happened with the Mauritius Convention on the Rules of Transparency, Treaty-Based Arbitrations, and then with the Singapore Convention. Um, there's also now a new multilateral instrument that's being proposed in the context of the work on investor state dispute settlement reform. So it, there was a move towards the softer work products and then a shift back to accommodate the not so soft um, work products once again. And it's difficult to attribute the precise reasons for this shift one way or another. Um, and it, depending on your view, it could even be as a result of the people in the room, uh, the administrations that were preparing the uh, instructions with delegations in the room. Um, it could even be something as small as that. The other thing that has been interesting, um, though, is that uh, the substantive focus of Answer Child's work has also expanded. So from harmonization, and I think this, this I can probably say we've seen it from about 2010, um, at least based on my own observations, from harmonization and unification of law, Answer Trial is now more open to promoting modernization and reform. And from private international law, the focus has shifted um, towards work uh, forays into, into areas that are more traditionally identified with the realm of public international law. So previously, a lot of Answer Trial's work was in the realm of arbitration, conciliation, carriage of goods, insolvency, electronic commerce, secure transactions, and the like. And then now we see uh, more work in the area of treaty-based arbitration, investor state dispute settlement reform, uh, which is leaning towards the realm of public international law. Although you can also point out that the the distinction between public and private international law really is uh, blurred and um, has in fact been challenged by a number of people as well. But whatever it is, I think it's important to note that these work products have continued to be products of consensus emerging from con uh, negotiations involving public sector, private sector, uh, people sector experts. And the, because we've got different work products, uh, there it's they lend themselves to being advanced in different contexts. Uh, commercial actors could take up an, an industry associations lobbying their home states to adopt them. Um, they've got, because you've got different types of work products, you can assess what is most likely to gain support from member states and private actors. Uh, and this feeds into the le legitimacy of Answer Trial's work. So that is the, um, what I have on Answer Trial. 
the next and final part um, of my time with you today, I will focus on the WHO, the World Health Organization, and its conventions, its regulations and recommendations. So with the Security Council resolutions, um, we have an issuance of a resolution that's legally binding on states and you have to comply. Uh, with the UNCITRAL um, suite of work products, as variety is issued for states to pick up and run with as they feel they, they see fit for themselves. With the WHO, we've, they, in terms of their conventions, regulations and recommendations, I would put them as somewhere in between um, the two categories that we've already explored. So in 1945, diplomats met to form the UN. At that time already, there was, a, there was a discussion to have a global health organization and it was in 1948 that the WHO's constitution came into force. The objective of the WHO is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. And this is in uh, Article 1 of the Constitution. WHO membership is open to all states and the full list of core functions are set out in the Constitution in Article 2 and can be divided into three categories. They have normative functions, so international conventions and agreements, regulations, standards, recommendations and guidelines. They have directing and coordinating functions, so health for all and its specific disease programs and research and technical cooperation functions, disease eradication, emergencies, bringing together scientists to discuss these issues. In terms of outcome documents of the WHO, at the state-to-state -state level, um, the WHO can and has developed international treaties under Article 19 of their constitution, binding regulations under Articles 21 to 22, um, and non-binding recommendations under Article 23. The World Health Assembly also passes resolutions at each of its annual meetings, but I won't be talking about those. In terms of international treaties, the WHO really has only got one treaty to its name so far. That's the 2003 Tobacco Control Framework Convention. But that being said, um, in December of last year, the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution ex establishing an intergovernmental negotiating body to determine the content and form of a new pandemic agreement. And that international negotiating body in turn, um, earlier this year in July, uh, decided that or agreed that that instrument should be a legally binding convention under Article 19, even though they would continue to consider the suitability of adopting legally binding regulations under Article 21 as well, uh, as the work on a binding pandemic treaty progressed. Um, this was a long discussion that led to this, this outcome. Um, so even though the proposal for a pandemic treaty was made um, earlier on, it took a while for the negotiating body to assess the various options and finally settle on that idea. Um, and it, it was a very deliberate decision to not close the door on also having binding regulations adjusted and developed along the way. So amending the current international health regulations. On that note, turning to binding regulations, uh, only two have been adopted by the World Health Assembly to date, the IHR 2005 and the nomenclature regulations, which are about um, nomenclature with rega regards to disease and causes of death. Such regulations are enacted through the World Health Assembly on condition that the uh, regulations are adopted with a two-third majority of members present and voting. And these regulations are legally binding on all WHO member states, except those which opt out. The IHR, which is in force today, was the result of a revision um, conducted in 2005, shortly after the SARS epidemic, which revealed many shortcomings of the prior, um, prior version of the international health regulations, including the lack of openness from various countries, for example. And the IHR is intended, as stated here uh, on the slide, to prevent, protect against, control, and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease, and so on and so forth. Um, so, for example, it imposes mandatory notification requirements on WHO member states in case of any event that may, that may constitute a public health emergency of international concern or fake. And it also requires them to maintain core capabilities for surveillance and response. The IHR also sets out public health measures 
that apply to travelers and health-related travel documents. And yet, despite the IHR um, being legally binding, the WHO lacks teeth to enforce um, the IHR. This has been described by some commentators as a choice of design, that the international health regulation does not confer legal powers of enforcement on the WHO to ensure state compliance. Um, and it's really been traced back to a reluctance on the part of states to cede control over their internal affairs. When you listen to um, commentators on, on the international health law uh, universe, a lot will, will draw distinctions with how the domain of health is handled and treated internationally and also by states as compared to other uh, more familiar areas of international law as an area where um, soft powers are uh, uh, highlighted, normative legitimacy and credibility is valued, and how there is a premium on openness, on cooperation, good faith, solidarity, self-restraint, uh, but really an ultimate retention of sovereign rights on national control measures. Um, as uh, revealed here in the quote that I've selected to highlight to you today, greater reliance is placed on legitimacy and credibility of the WHO as a provider of authoritative guidance and information and on its authority to, um, well, so on its technical assistance, on its authority to convene experts and stakeholders. And the aim is at scientific consensus regardless of political differences. In fact, one of the way that the WHO um, directs and coordinates public health is through the Director General's declaration of a fake, a public health uh, emergency of international concern. And such declaration represents an instrument of international public authority. Um, and it's, it leads to governance by information. So the Director General's declaration of a fake informs the international community of the international dimension of a threat to public health. And though it does not create any new obligations for member states in and of itself, um, often there are uh, instruments that are concluded at, at regional levels, for example, or national levels that require national authorities or competent authorities to take action in the event of a fake. Um, a declaration of a fake raises alert levels um, towards an extraordinary event that has two things. It cannot be tackled purely at the national level and it poses a risk of international spread. This is different from the declaration of pandemic, which is done pursuant to the WHO's pandemic guidelines. Although I would say here that there isn't a widely accepted definition of a pandemic even. Um, and in fact, about, maybe the pandemic treaty will address this, maybe it won't, we're not sure. It's one of the issues that has been flagged as potentially um, to be taken up in the context of the new pandemic treaty. We are currently living in times of fake still uh, with COVID and I think over the last three years we've all become personally very well acquainted with what this means um, in terms of our daily lives and the actions of what national authorities can do and, and, and the actions that they can take. Uh, but for example, uh, at least for the WHO perspective, following the declaration of a fake, the World Health Organization Director General is empowered to issue temporary recommendations under Article 15 of the health regulations. Um, so an, there will be an emergency committee that would advise the Director General on what recommendations to issue. These are non-binding by virtue of uh, Article 1 of the international health regulations, but at the same time, the health regulations acknowledge or state that such temporary recommendations may include measures to be implemented and that suggests some level of bindingness. Um, so to reconcile articles 1 and 15 to uh, what, I, what I would point to is that the issue is probably with the consequences of a temporary recommendation and for that we can turn to article 43 of the health regulations which places on member states which go beyond uh, WHO recommendation the obligation to report their actions to the WHO and to justify the higher degree of restrictiveness. So th there's essentially an obligation of explanation. In the case of COVID-19, um, DG Tedros 
uh, issue temporary recommendations on isolations and quarantines, as well as on not imposing travel restrictions. Of course, we know now by our experience that the latter was uh, in fact subsequently revisited and updated as an invitation to implement appropriate travel measures with consideration of the public health benefits um, and providing appropriate public health rationales for any additional health measures. The power to declare uh, a fake was endowed on the WHO DG after SARS in 2005. So by all measures, it's actually quite a, it's a relatively recent power that has been bestowed on, on the Director General. Since then though, the WHO DGs over time have declared a fake um, on seven occasions. So we've got the H1N1 influenza in 2009, while polio virus in 2014, West African Ebola outbreak 2014, Zika 2016, Ebola and the DRC in 2019, 2020 COVID-19, uh, and monkeypox in July 2022. Before declaring a fake, the Director General must summon an emergency committee, which is to be composed of experts in relevant fields with regard to the subject matter of the international health regulations, such as the transport of spread of disease. These experts are selected from a roster devised by the DG in consultation with members, and the, uh, mem the emergency committee has to be geographically diverse. They only have an advisory role, these emergency committees, um, but it is established practice that the WHO DG fully defers to their advice. The emergency committee speaks with one voice and uh, there are no minutes that are published beyond whatever outcome statement that they may issue. The declaration of a fake, as you may or may not have already um, observed, is fraught with controversy. The it came about in 2003 because the WHO DG at the time, Brundtland, declared on her own initiative the spread of SARS as an emergency, specifically a worldwide health threat. Um, she then issued the WHO's first travel advisory in 55 years. Um, and this was, at the time, uh, a task that fell to the World Health Assembly, composed of member states and the executive board. A subset of member states, but these bodies had been slow in her mind to respond. Brundtland's actions at the time were criticised for being ultraviaries, but I but it's been accepted since that it crystallised a broader appreciation for quick decision making in the face of such health situations. In two in two thousand and nine to twenty ten, we had other DGs that then um, took up and ran with the power to declare fakes, uh, but. It so happened that the, the next DG was criticized. So Margaret Chan was criticized first for declaring a pandemic too soon and then for not declaring a pandemic fast enough in, in, a, in a subsequent case. So she was criticized for declaring a pandemic too soon in the case of H1N1. Um, there were suspicions at the time that this might have been done for to economically benefit certain private actors, never proven. And then later she was criticized for being too late in declaring the West African Ebola crisis a fake. Um, ostensibly, she was too deferential to the affected governments. Are there any means of scrutinizing such declarations? Yes and no. Um, Article 50 of the IHR gives the Director General power to constitute a review committee with the mandate of providing technical advice to the Director General on any matter referred to it regarding the functioning of these regulations. And these committees' conclusions may be presented to the World Health Assembly. At the request of the executive board, the former DG Margaret Chan commissioned reviews into the fakes um, that were declared over the H1N1 uh, it flu and the Western African, West African Ebola crisis that followed after. Similarly, the WHO undertook a review of its pandemic preparedness and response uh, in the, in the situation of COVID-19. The review committee on the functioning of the IHR 2005 during the COVID-19 response pre presented its report to the 74th session of the WHA, which I think was earlier this year or no, last year perhaps. Um, and the IHR review committee's key findings and recommendations were that states parties should share relevant public health information with the WHO for assessment of the public health risk as soon as the information becomes available. 
that the WHO should adopt a formal and clearer approach for conveying to the public the significance of the public health emergency of international concern and the key public health responses expected from states in relation to vaccine activities, funding, release of stockpiles, and so on. Third, that states' parties should apply a risk-based approach to implementing additional health measures under Article 43 um, and uphold the spirit of the IHR to ensure that such measures are necessary, proportionate, and non-discriminatory, and that the WHO should examine the term unnecessary interference with international traffic to arrive at a more practical and consensual interpretation of this term. States' parties and the WHO, number four, should consider the benefits of developing a global convention on the pandemic. And this may include provisions not addressed by the IHR, um, but also maybe areas that are. And five, states' parties should inform the WHO about the establishment of its national competent authority responsible for IHR implementation. And there should be a concomitant uh, development by the WHO of an accountability framework for, co for competent authorities responsible for implementing the IHR. Last of all, the WHO should work with states, parties and relevant stakeholders to implement a universal periodic review mechanism to assess, report on and improve compliance with IHR requirements. Um, so these were some of the key findings and the recommendations, that, at least the six that I wanted to highlight for you. There was also an independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response um, that conducted an independent review of the international health response to COVID at the request of the World Health Assembly. Um, and they presented their report in May 2021, uh, proposing recommendations in two sets, immediate recommendations aimed at curbing COVID-19 transmission, and then a set of recommendations that would transform the international system for pandemic preparedness and response. And I've kind of, I won't go, go into each of the review findings here, but I've listed a few of its recommendations from this independent panel. Uh, neither the WHO constitution nor the IHR determine any consequences if a review committee were to find evidence of malfeasance. General public international law, the draft articles on state response, on, sorry, on responsibility of international organizations also uh, provide little direction. Um, possible consequences are primarily, as it's generally said, uh, of a political nature, but fact-finding has contributed to improvements to WHO's internal processes and decision-making, and we can see accretionary improvements being made over time. What's interesting over the two sets of reviews review findings is that both the IHR Review Committee and the Independent Panel um, supported the development of an international pandemic treaty. And so, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is a process that's currently underway. We're currently at the cultivation stage, uh, but we're likely to deal with um, areas of deficiencies that have been thrown into relief by the pandemic in uh, classified into four areas, a national preparedness and response, sustained predictable funding uh, to health emergency preparedness and response, global preparedness and response, and governance and oversight mechanisms. Um, it appears uh, that the IHR review committee's leaning towards a convention might have been motivated by how long it took to amend the IHR, or rather how long it, would, it might take to um, finalize the IHR, uh, but it could also be due to other factors. Um, so this is what I wanted to cover from the WHO uh, perspective, and I hope it's given you a sense of the, as I mentioned, the different types of IO products that can come, that can affect state uh, behavior in different ways. So a very directed legal obligation approach, a suite of work products that can be selected and taken up by states, and then something that's kind of in between um, uh, where you have member states that have a, an obligation to explain, report and explain, uh, because there's a legally binding nature as a result of certain declarations that are made, certain impacts uh, of, of, the, of the level of alerts that are, uh, are reached or triggered by certain declarations and then the ensuing uh, implications that arise from there. Um, that's trying to draw a common thread insofar as a generalization is possible to be made, bearing in mind my caveat right at the start that actually it's quite difficult to draw these generalizations, but that's keeping it at a very big picture level. I have just a few minutes left um, and I wanted to offer some closing remarks 
uh, I, if there's, if there are any, I don't know, I'm not sure there are any questions, I can't see it on my iPad, you're welcome to shout out if there are, uh, but just afford me a few minutes now, perhaps to uh, offer you um, some of the um, uh, implications that I wanted to draw out from the proliferation in the number of IOs. Uh, so the proliferation of IOs has, which I alluded to at the start in my opening remarks, has led to its own set of difficulties. Perceptions of duplication, of a bureaucracy, lack of transparency, accountability, and so on. And occasionally, this has also been exacerbated by an expansion in the mandate of IOs that already exist, leading to overlaps or perceived overlaps with the activities of other IOs. And it is not unusual for calls to be made for international organizations to collaborate and coordinate in their activities. And there are different ways in which international organizations, focusing right now with my comments on intergovernmental organizations, can cooperate and coordinate. They can exchange information like the WHO Secretariat and the CBD Secretariat, the Convention on Biological Diversity, are now, as I'm told, exchanging information on access and benefit sharing because of the Nagoya Protocol developed under the CBD framework, but because access and benefit sharing issues are very, very relevant to the new pandemic treaty. Second of all, participation in respective forums of discussion. So for example, Ancetral, Yudua, and the HCCH, they cooperate by having state, amongst other things, by having their representatives from the secretariats at each of the other's um, forums for discussion. So it's not unusual to hear a representative from the Ancetral Secretariat deliver a statement on an agenda item at the HCCH meeting in The Hague. Um, the third uh, area is establishing institutional arrangements to implement a given activity, even joint development of, uh, of areas of work, uh, and drawing again on what the three types that we've talked about today. We've got Ancestral and ICSID that right now is developing a jointly developing the code of conduct that will apply to adjudicators um, in the context of investor state disputes. In an age of um, growing International complexity, I think such arrangements between intergovernmental organizations will continue to be important, if not more so. The second trend that I wanted to draw out as part of my concluding remarks is how international organizations, now more broadly speaking, have become more deliberate in their relations with civil society actors, NGOs, and such like. And the main growth of this um, NGO civil society participation in global government has, and global governance, I beg your pardon, has actually, I think, been on the uptake since the 1990s. Modes of direct participation include accreditation, membership of government delegations, policy consultations. Um, in, 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 the, in the case of accreditation, for example, non-governmental organizations at the UN can be conferred special or general consultative status. There can also be accreditation at specific meetings. We have the ARIA formula that enables civil society associations to directly brief the UN Security Council. Uh, Non-state members can be members of government delegations, is what happens very often at UNCETRAL. And beyond consultative engagements, actors uh, such as industry bodies and business associations can also be formally represented at the table, as we see in UNCETRAL meetings, and I spoke about this earlier. Um, entire theories have been written about how civil society, non-governmental associations and actors contribute to global governance. So I will not get into that here, uh, but I think it's useful to just appreciate that um, for some, uh, this trend uh, is, is something to be perceived with a little bit of caution uh, because civil society groups may only engage where their aims coincide with the interests of member states. So what do they add? Um, in fact, some have suggested that states manipulate uh, non-government actors to advance their own interests um, and to advance their own power dynamic uh, with, uh, within, within a particular negotiation. Um, and on the other hand, civil society groups may have their own interests, resources and influences distinct from states um, and, and they might, in, through that way, uh, influence the, the agenda. 
there are five dimensions of possible impacts that have been drawn out by, by certain commentators. Uh, institutions, so influence of institutional evolution of, gov of global regulation, like the reform, establishment, dissolution of certain agencies. Uh, the UN uh, is, is attributed to the activism of internationalist groups. The WTO uh, is reportedly emanating, uh, well, it's not reportedly, it, it, they did start out with proposals that were first made um, through uh, WEF agendas, influence over what is considered relative priorities, as we saw with AIDS in the 1990s, decisions, the WTO move in 2003 to relax IP provisions for essential medicines traced to concerted NGO campaigns, discourses, so overarching concepts, language, analytical framings employed in policy discussions, deeper structures, and by this uh, I, I refer to shifts um, away from state-centric governance that some commentators uh, have said it is taking place. Um, so I've talked about how on the one hand they might simply be uh, an extension of states or they may only operate when their interests coincide with states. But on the other hand, it's also been noted that they could fill legitimacy gaps uh, by serving as a transmission belt between the discourses or, that are taking place at the level of international organizations with the broader community that may not be directly involved. Um, as we move into the future, I mean, the, you may have your view on, on the contribution of, of non-government sectors, I think generally positive, uh, but some view certain, certain types of behavior with caution. But as we move into the future, then what cannot be disputed is international organizations will need to find that balance to maximize the positive elements, the expertise that can be drawn from the non-government sector um, versus, for instance, the the criticisms that they might be unaccountable uh, of their involvement. And that balance will have to be struck by each international organization depending on its area of expertise. That brings me more or less to the end of my hour with you. Uh, and because of various things, I've actually crossed the five o'clock mark. Um, so maybe I'll hand back to uh, Patricia and I'm in your hands as to how you would like to proceed um, for the rest of our time together, whether to wrap or otherwise. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie. That was really an excellent overview of three very different international organizations and bodies um, on their mandate, procedures, bindingness of resolutions, um, decisions or not. Um, but I think I have to say, you know, three of them that you've experienced personally, both in your time in New York at the UN, but also your works in UNCTRAL and now your experience with the negotiations of the pandemic treaty. So I think we should explain to the participants that there's, you know, you have personal experience in uh, in this organization. So because we, we're um, just uh, over time, maybe I'll open the floor for one or two questions. Um, please feel free free to you know raise your hand and ask your questions live uh, or um, put them in the chat let's see if our participants so there is one question in the in the chat from uh Xuyang Guo from China um who's a lecturer um in in Chantou University the question is concerning how do you see the treaty making power of ASEAN member states and non-member states like China, South Korea, and the influence of uh, those non-member states and ASEAN in the making of the RCEP making process. So I'll leave that to you, Natalie. Thank you very much. And thank you um, to the to, uh Professor Kuo, for your question. Um, the interesting thing about the ASEAN, so your question, because of the reference to RCEP, uh, I will take up in the context of the economic agreements that ASEAN concludes. Um, the interesting thing about ASEAN agreements, including in the, in the economic context, is the member states are, are by themselves the parties to the treaty. So unlike the situation in the European Union, where there is a transfer of competence and where it's, we talk about an EU FTA, um, by and large, you would be talking about a, a, an, an agreement between the EU and on the one hand um, and the 
the dialogue partner using the ASEAN term on the other hand. But in the case of an ASEAN treaty, uh, whether it's an internal ASEAN treaty, whether it's an RCEP treaty, each ASEAN member state is individually a party to um, the free trade agreement concerned. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what, uh, what your question is particularly getting at, but I wanted to take the opportunity to draw out um, that one of the key elements uh, of these agreements um, is really the how the how ASEAN and its dialogue partners interact considering the ASEAN way. Um, whilst each ASEAN member state are themselves party to the agreement, there is a process of coordination uh, within the ASEAN family that then presents their position as ASEAN to the other dialogue partners uh, who are uh, part of the negotiations. So it's a there is an, an ASEAN consensus that is first reached um, that is then brought to the others and then and then a dialogue takes place from there. Um, and I have in other contexts asked the question um, of to what extent this particular practice where ASEAN member states are individually party to the treaties, uh, where they have this process of negotiation to form um, an ASEAN consensus before bringing it to the non-ASEAN member states is facilitative of ASEAN centrality, um, which is to put which has its own definition and, and people have different views of what, what that means but to what extent in my view does it advance the interests of the ASEAN region as a whole um, I lean in favor of, of how things are currently done because uh, I do think that there are ways of advancing intra-regional economic integration uh, notwithstanding that there isn't a transfer of competence to a supranational body uh, by utilizing the dialogue that takes place between the ASEAN member states on the one hand, um, within the ASEAN member states, and then between the ASEAN member states and the non-ASEAN dialogue partners on the other. So I hope that goes some way towards uh, addressing at least an aspect of your question. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'm not seeing any more questions on the chat, nor hands up. Um, so I think that we can uh, conclude with giving you a round of our virtual applause and thanking you so much, Natalie, for taking time from your busy schedule um, and um, and sharing with you your experience and trying to put it in a um, in in a way that is um, you know structured, showing the similarities, differences, and and really showing how. Uh, international organizations um, to which um, all member states uh, of um, well, all the, the states in the world are are today a part of and, and they're part of several uh, organizations and they they work in these different contexts and and certainly in different ways they all end up by informing the state's uh, behavior so thank you so much Natalie it was a pleasure having you uh, with us on on behalf of uh, the Academy of uh, Nilofer and myself um, uh, it's so wonderful to have you uh, with us and uh, uh, we hope we'll, we'll get you back another time uh, so that you can continue developing uh, these important issues or other issues. So um, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. It was wonderful. <laughs>